Oxygen Blast Technical Seminars are an Intertech production. For instructor-led.net, Java, and XML courses, visit us at www.intertech.com. So right now, if I wanted to go execute my package, what's going to start up? Well, this one's going to start up, and simultaneously, this one's going to start up as well. Keep that in mind. All your different tasks are going to run simultaneously unless they're in a specific sequence container. Only when this one was completed will it start this one down here. And again, just double click any of them and you can go ahead and work with that data flow task working with these different transformations. I can drag any number of shapes on here like an old ADB data source. And you'll notice how once I get this guy configured, he'll show up down here in the connection manager. So I can go ahead and you see this red X, he's telling me, hey, this thing isn't set up yet. You've got to set this guy up. You can actually double click the red arrow or the red X, if you will, to help you configure this guy. So here I can go ahead and choose to create my connection manager. And it says, hey, you don't have any down here yet. It's like, oh, yeah, okay. So I'll go ahead and choose one here. Maybe Adventure Works. Click OK. And then I could choose perhaps a name of a table or put in a SQL command, if you will, and then choose that actual object. Right? And there's a ridiculous amount of objects in here. You know? And now notice the red X went away and it's good to go. As well, down here in my connection manager screen, you can see I've got AdventureWorks all ready to go. Now I might just go ahead and say, yep, there's my source. And I need a flat file destination. Right? And the happy path is green. I'll just have that connect to my flat file destination. Again, setting up where this is actually going to go, and I don't have a connection manager here either. So I could go ahead with delimited, fixed width, uh, ragged writer, fixed width, road, you know, whatever I want to actually have it set up to. And then I can choose a file name. Showing me the actual columns there. And I can go to the mappings and I can see that the columns from the available input columns are going to be copied over to the file. I click OK and look at that, the red X is away. You know, some of these things are like, ooh, I got to line this up, right? I got to move this half a millimeter over to the right. This is ridiculous. Don't do that. You can just right or select a group of the items here and go to your format drop down menu. Here you can go ahead and align like maybe on centers. Look at that. Isn't that slick? There's all kinds of other cool things you can do. For example, you can choose to um, oh, auto size these things. Oh, nice, it took off my alignment. Take a look at some of the other things you can do off your format menu as well. Uh, make same size, horizontal spacing, vertical spacing. You know, that's going to mean more to you when you uh, have more shapes on here. Okay. So this is my data flow task, and this one happens to be data flow task one. I go back to my control flow. Keep in mind, it's this guy right here. I can't, I got to remove the connection before I can move that guy. That's fine. All right, does not like that at all. I can go ahead and blow away some of these other ones here. And get rid of my sequence container. It's giving me all kinds of warnings here about deleting that. Are you sure? Because it's a big deal when you're blowing those away. Remember, every object within the control flow or the data flow has its own set of properties. Like here, for example, I'm looking at data flow 1. These are the properties for it. Now, if you've done any development in .NET, or if you've taken like a C-Sharp or VB class with me or an ASP.NET class, oftentimes I recommend my students sort them alphabetically. However, when I'm doing BI work with SSIS, IS, or RS, I like to sort them by category because there's usually not that many properties and it does help me find the properties because of their types. They've got some really good categories in the properties window when you're actually running these. See the asterisk at the top? It means it hasn't been saved yet. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the save all. And that's saving those changes off to that data flow. Now you might actually have multiple tasks on this control flow. As we saw, we had multiple data flow tasks. Or you might just have one and that's it. I can set up a, uh, event handlers to go ahead and subscribe to certain events here. Like for example, handling the on error, 
on information or what have you, and even explore the package, taking a look at the variables that are contained within it. These are some of the system variables. You can tell by the color of them, and they start, of course, with that namespace system, and even my event handlers. So now I can go ahead and execute this thing, and it turned green. Yay! We love green. Green means it is successful. And it says down here at the output window, finish, success. And then, of course, I can stop debugging. If it failed, I would see red, right? If it was some reason it couldn't connect to the file, it couldn't write, or it could be even worse than that. So that should have created a little text file in the root of my C drive. If it did not, it's okay, I'll go on like nothing happened. <laughs> okay, so here we got, oh, let's see, today is it 4 or 5, test.txt, and here's where it moved all that information over to this txt file directly from the uh, AdventureWorks database. So that's pretty cool. That's just a little taste of what you can do with SSIS. Know that back over here in the data floor, I can obviously choose many more destinations. And yes, I may want to set up a SAD path as well. Maybe have a flat file destination, especially if I am actually doing some transformations. Uh, this is something we can go into class, though. Uh, we can see how we can actually do like data conversions, copy a column, maybe create a derived column from two or three other columns. There's a lot of really cool things we can do in the transformation section. As well, remember, we are also going to cover many best practices. Uh, one of the last chapters we cover is just a huge number of best practices. Like, for example, some of these transformations are blocking. They will literally wait until it's done. They'll wait until the transformation's done before, or they've gotten all the data from the source before they perform the transformation. Like, for example, this sort one can't actually sort all your records until it's gathered them all up from your source. Can you imagine what it's doing in the memory buffers? It's getting absolutely mammoth in memory, then it performs a sort, and then it pushes it off to your destination. You know, as a general rule when we're doing our transformations, we want to do that work as close to the actual data sources as possible before we actually get it into SSIS. Even though it's intended and it was designed to handle large amounts of memory, still there's a lot of best practices you need to follow within SSIS. And when you take the training with us at Intertech, I'll hook you up with those best practices. As well, I always tell people this, when you come take a class, by all means, you also want to talk to the other students who are doing the exact same st stuff you're doing. That's one of the advantages of taking classroom training is just to talk to other people who are doing the same thing, right? There's how many people do you know on your block that are doing SSIS packages, right? Exactly. Not Maybe not too many of your neighbors, but you come together in a community, like a classroom environment, you can all discuss these features. Now, this is done. All I'd have to do is deploy this package. And there's actually three different destinations I can choose. They always talk about two of them like with, S with SQL Server 2008, like you can either go to the file system or you can go to the database. There is actually the old, old one, which is the package store, and that's just a specific file location. And of course, once it's deployed, it can be executed. And of course, there's a few different ways that we can go ahead and execute our packages, like from the command line, we can run DT exec. It'll go ahead and run our packages, right? Or if you need help setting up all the different options, open up DT exec UI, which is another command line utility. And this guy will actually set up all the different files, or I should say properties. Maybe you're going to have a separate configuration file. You can use that as well. Or different options. There's many different options you can set when you execute your package. And this guy will actually help you build it all up and ultimately choose the command line. It's, by the way, that DT exec UI, he's just calling this guy in the background when you're done. DT exec, that's actually what executes your package. So this is just a little taste of doing SSIS development. I could certainly go ahead and add additional packages, or I could work with additional projects as well. One thing I always see with students is sometimes the Solution Explorer doesn't show up for them in bids. And a little tip that I like to tell everybody is if you just go into Tools and Options within bids, and you go down to Projects and Solutions under General, there is a little checkbox here to always show solution. I always have that guy checked because I always want to see that container for my project. It drives me nuts not to see that. So if you open up Bids, let me uncheck that for you, and you see this and you're like, where's my solution? Well, you got to turn that on in Bids. Just go to Tools and Options and check that box for always showing solution. That's under your Projects and Solutions area under Tools Objects. Cool. So now, 
I showed you a little bit about bids and of course how we can work with AS, RS, and IS. Those are three separate classes that I deliver at Intertech besides the .NET classes and the TFS classes that I teach. And we do have the five different tabs. Remember, how many control flows can we have in a package? One. How many data flows? Well, that depends on how many data flow tasks you dragged and dropped right onto your control flow. We've got event handlers that we can create to subscribe to certain events within our packages, as well as the package explorer, which allows us to actually look in there and find out more information about it, such as maybe custom variables. Progress and execution. You know, I showed you when, when my package ran, it ran instantaneously. That was ridiculously fast, and that's not real world, guys. Real world, you're going to be moving maybe several hundred thousand records. Who knows even more than that? And while that's running, it's nice to see what's going on. See, when you develop your package, you're not just going to write it once and you're done. You're going to be making all kinds of tweaks, try again, try again, try again. And then when you feel it's rock solid, then you'll run it, you'll schedule it as a production package. And then the next day when it comes back because you forgot something, then you'll make some more modifications to it again because so, this is real world, right? <laughs> we oh, forgot that one little thing. <laughs> and then you'll fix that and you'll test it within bits and then it officially become a rock solid package. Of course, we can go ahead and monitor the progress while we test it within bids uh, and make sure that it's working properly. So using our packages, we can import and export our packages as well. We have an import and export tool for moving it either to a certain file location or to the database itself. We can manage them and run them right within bids and, of course, monitor them as they're executing. There is an import and export wizard that can help you create a package. If you don't want to open up bids, if you just need to get some data moved quick and fast, you don't have to use bids. There's a SQL Server import and export wizard. This will actually create a package on the fly in memory. And there'll be a little checkbox at the end that says, hey, you want to save this guy off as a package? And it'll go ahead and save it as a file for you, as a DTSX. Otherwise, it just throws it away. We do have a configuration wizard and a package installation wizard. These are all available right within bids. And of course, these are some of those command line utilities. Notice the DT exec and the DT exec UI. DT util is a nice way of moving packages as well, not executing them, but to actually make changes to them or move them. A lot of functionality built into DT util. You know what? Thanks a lot for watching, guys. I hope this has been an informational video for you. Uh, if you'd like to come to Minnesota, take some training, or if your group is large enough, I can come out there as well as part of Intertech. Uh, go ahead and just go to intertech.com. That's our website. And I'd be honored to have you in my class uh, learning about SSIS or any of the other BI classes or whatever you might be needing. Uh, I do love teaching. I'm a teacher first and then a lover of the technology second. That's very important. So keep in mind, I want to remind you, the class will use slightly different courseware than the mock that you're looking at because I... The mock class has some nice graphics, but I like to uh, have a little more hands-on practice with labs and exercises. So happy ETLing, folks, and have a great day. For more free learning resources and to see the latest lineup of our instructor-led .NET, Java, and XML courses, visit us at www.intertech.com.